Hello, my friends. It is First Chapter Friday, and I am so excited to bring you this uh, spooky boy book. It has been a long time since I have done First Chapter Friday. I acknowledge that. I have been reading. Don't come for me. Um, but I just haven't been sharing them. I've just been really busy during my planning periods and um, in my free time with some of the other things that I do. So I just haven't had time. So I sincerely apologize. And I hope that uh, coming back from holiday break that I will have some time to uh, pick back up. So we are going to read Nothing But uh, Blackened Teeth. This is a book by Cassandra Nall. She also wrote a song for Quiet, Hammers and Bones, and These Deathless Bones. So she is, in fact, a horror writer. I am so excited um, about this. Uh, the dedication page, actually, I've never seen anything like this. So it was copywritten in 2021. It is almost the end of 2021. We've only got like two weeks left. Um, this is from the Macmillan Publishing Book Company. And the dedication page says, to my real life mouse, we got out. And that's very interesting. I wonder what that is referring to. So we are going to check out this book. I'm just going to, this is kind of my first look at her um, since I purchased it, that is a very long chapter, so we might not be able to make it through it in the next 20 minutes, but we will do the best we can. Uh, let me know if you like this style of book. If not, um, we won't have to keep reading it. If you want to read something similar, or I've just actually got a huge group of new books, and, uh, my goal for next year, in case you guys have a book, um, resolution is, I could not think that word, uh, is to read as many books as I buy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be read the books that I buy, but I have to read as many books that I buy because my to be read shelf uh, is out of control. And I think that reading books and buying books for me are two completely separate hobbies of which I am obsessed with both, but I do buy a lot of books and I think maybe I should just read as many as I want. Ready? How the fuck are you this rich? I took the old vestibule, the wood ceiling that do domed our heads. Time etched itself into the shape and stretch of the hidden mansion, its presence apparent in the texture of the crumbling dark. It felt profane to see the place like this without curators to chaperone us. No one to say, do not touch and be careful. This was old before the word was for such things existed that Philip could finance its discretion, lock, stock, no question, and without self-reproach was systematic in our fundamental choices. He shrugged, smile cocked, like the sure thing that was his whole life. I'm, come on, it's a wedding gift. They're supposed to be extravagant. I just am really distracted. I'm so sorry. All right, extravagant is matching Rolex watches. Extravagant. I slowed down for effect, taking time between each syllable. Is a honeymoon trip to Hawaii. This, on the other hand, this is beyond absurd, dude. You flew us all to Japan, first class, and then rented the fucking Imperial Palace, or it's not a palace, it's just a mansion. Oh, okay, like that's good enough, right? And I didn't rent the building per se, just got us permits to spend a few nights. Oh, like that makes it any less ridiculous. Shh, stop, 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 don't finish. I get it, I get it. Philip dropped his suitcase at the door and palmed the back of his neck, looking sheepish. His varsity jacket, still perfectly fitted to his broad quarterback frame, blazed indigo and yellow where it caught the sun. In the dusk, the letters of his name were guilt and glory and good stitching. Poster boy, perfect. Everyone craved him like a vice. Seriously, though, it's no big deal. No big deal. He says, fucking billionaires. Cat, have you ever cannonballed into a cold lake? The shock of an old memory is kind of like that. Every neuron singing, right? Hosanna, here we are. You forgot about us, but we didn't forget about you. 
only one other person had ever said my name that way. Is Lynn coming? I licked the corner of a tooth. No comment. You could just smell the cream of the lip of Philip's grin. Though, oh, that's a weird phrasing. I tried not to cringe, to wince. Beset by zoetrope of sudden emotions. I hadn't spoken to Lynn since before I checked myself into the hospital for terminal any E N N U I. I don't know what that word is. Exhaustion so acute it could be sanitized with sleep. Couldn't be remedied by anything but a twist of rope tugged tight. The doctors kept me for six days and then sent me home. Pockets stuffed with pills and appointments and placards advocating the commandments of safer living. I spent six months doing the work, a shut in commitment to the betterment of self, university, and my study of Japanese literature, both formal and otherwise shelved temporarily. When I came out, there was a sudden wedding in a world so seamlessly closed up about the space where I stood. You'd think that I'd never there in the first place. The door thumped shut and we both jumped, turned like cogs. All my grief riled somewhere else. I swear if that moment wasn't magic, wasn't everything right and good, nothing else in the world is allowed to call itself beautiful. It was perfect. A Hallmark commercial in a freeze frame, autumn leaves swirling against a backdrop of beech and white cedar. God rays dripping between the boughs. Fias and Talia emerging, arms looped together, eyes only for each other, smiling so hard that all I wanted to do was promise them that forever will always eternally unchanged be just like this. Okay, so I don't know what this next phrase is, but it appears to be Japanese. Um, Sunyo Matsuyama Nami Mo Konamu. My head jackknifed up. That was a, that was, there it was. The shudder of a girl's voice, sweet despite its coarseness, like a square of fabric worn ragged, like a sound carried on the last ragged breath of the failing record player. A hallucination. It had to be. It needed to be. You hear something spooky? Said Philip. I strong armed a smile into place. Yeah, there's a headless lady in the air right there who said she killed herself because you never called. You shouldn't ghost people, dude. It's bad manners. His joviality waked away and his own expression tripping over old memories. Hey, look, if you're still mad about, it's old news. I shook my head, old and buried. I'm still sorry. You said that already. I know, but that shit I did, that wasn't cool. You and me, I should have found a better way of ending things. And... His hands fluttered up and fell in the time with the back seat of his confession. Philip's expression cra cragged the guilt he'd held for years like a reliquiary. This wasn't the first time we'd had this conversation. This wasn't even the 10th or the 30th. Truth was, I hated that he still felt guilty. It wasn't charitable, but apologies don't, didn't exonerate the sinner, only compelled graciousness from its recipient. The words, each time they came, so repetitive that I could tune a clock to their angst, sawed through me. You can't move forward when someone keeps dragging you back. I trapped the tip of my tongue between my teeth, bit down, and exhaled through the sting. Old news, I said. I'm so sorry. For punishment, I guess, is dealing with bad puns forever. I'd take it. Philip made a bassoon noise deep in his lungs and kind of laugh and traded his Timberlands for the pair of slippers he brought as a souvenir at the shop at the airport. It cost him too much, but the attendant, her lipstick game sharp as paper cut, had thrown in her number. Philip always folds for wolves in girl skin clothing. Long as you promise you don't spook the ghosts. In another life, I had been brave. Growing up where we did, back in the melting pot Malaysia, down in the tropics where the mangroves spread disease as myths, you knew to look for ghosts. Superstition was a compass. It steered your attention through thin alleys, led your eyes to crosswalks, filthy with makeshift sirens, offering an appeasement scattered by traffic. The five of us spent years in restless pilgrimage, searching for the holy dead of Kumar Lupai. Every haunted house, every abandoned hospital, every storm drain had clasped a body like a girl's final prayer. We sieved through them all, and I was always in the vanguard, torchlight in hand, eager to show the way. Things change. A breeze slouched through the decaying she screens, lavender, mildew, sandalwood, and rotting incense. Some of the paper panels were peeling in strips. 
Others gnawed to the still vividly lacquered wood, but the tatami mantling the floors. There was so much, too much of it everywhere, more than even a high and noble house should hold, and all of it was pristine, store-bought fresh even, when the centuries should have chewed the straw to mulch. The sight of it itched under my skin, like someone fed those small black picnic ants through a vein, somehow got them to spread out under a thin layer of dermis, got them to start digging. I shuddered. It was possible that somebody had come in to renovate, maybe someone who decided that if the manor was going to house five idiot foreigners, they might as well make it a bit more livable. But the interior didn't smell like it had people here, not for a long, long time, and smelled instead like an old building stew, green and damp and dark and hungry, hollow as a stomach had forgotten what it was like to eat. Does someone use this as a summer house? Philip shrugged. Probably. I don't know. I don't even want to talk too much about it. I shook my head because something about this place doesn't add up. We're probably not the only customers that destination horror business, said Philip, running. Relax. Fiaz whistled, interrupting me. Yeah, this is a real deal. My man, Philip, you're a gentleman and six quarters. Was nothing, Philip barred a bright, fierce grin at the happy couple. Just some old fashioned luck and the family money that put to great use. You don't even quit about that inheritance do you said Fiaz smile only as far as the spokes of his cheeks eyes flat he cupped an arm around Talia's waist we know you're rich Philip come on dude that was what I was trying to say arms spread body language open as a house with no doors you couldn't hate Philip for long but Fiaz was trying besides my money is your money brothers to the end you know Talia was taller duskier than Fiaz part Bengali Heart Teglu, legs like stilts, a smile like a Christmas miracle. And when she laughed low, like the note of the cello's long throat, it was as if she had been to one, been the one to teach the world the sound. Talia laid long fingertips atop the jut of Philip's shoulder and bowed her head precociously regal. Don't fight both of you, not today. Who's fighting, Fias? Had a radio voice, an easy listening tenor, just out south of prime time, where he, no, nothing some hard living couldn't fix, some good cigarettes and bad whiskey. Wasn't much for anything except doughier than ever. Not fat, not that there was anything wrong with that, but gluttonous almost, soft as good clay, beauty and her unfinished pottery, half molded, still slick, the tips of Fias's hair jutting out at the night. Dude with sweat. I felt an immediate guilt for the unkind observation. Fiaz was my best friend. He'd done more than his share, talking Talia down from wailing, walling me out. She and I made eye contact as the boys bantered, their voices prickling like heckles of the Doberman, short and stark. Animosity panting between the niceness and Talia's expression congealed with dislike. I stroked a hand over my arm and tried to keep a smile on. A muscle like Talia's jaw went rigid as she cracked her face into a similar configuration. Her smile tense, mineral, bracketed with impatience. I didn't think you were actually going to come, not after everything you had to say about the two of us. Courtesy velveted her voice. Talia peeled from Fia's and strode across the room, closing the distance between us two inches too much. I could smell her, rose and sweet cardamom. You two weren't happy, I said, hands burrowed in my pockets. A slight back, words lean towards the axis of my spine. I'm glad you figured out your differences, but at the time, you're each other's throats. Talia had almost three inches on me and levered that to her advantage, looming. Your insistence that we break up didn't help. I didn't insist anything. I heard my voice constrict the register narrow so much, each syllable cut and was crushed together into a slurry. I just thought... You nearly cost me everything, Talia said, still staccato in her rage. I had both of your interests at heart. Are you sure? Her expression shaded with pity. I glanced at the boys. Or were you hoping to get Fiaz back? We had dated, if you called it that. Eight weeks, no chemistry, not even a kiss. We'd been older. Our confidence less flimsy, less dependent on the perceived temperature of our reputations. We'd known it to end, we'd known to end it sooner. Something came out of that, at least, a friendship, guilt-bruised, gestated in the shambles of a stillborn romance, but a friendship nonetheless. 
The light deepened in the house, blued where it had broken into the corridors. I'm fucking sure of it. Jesus, I don't want your man. I told her with as much detachment as I could scrounge. Not wanting to sell Fia short. Not after all of this. It's been years since we were together, and I don't know what more you want from me. I've apologized. I've tried to make it up for you. Talia at the corner of her lips with her. You could have stayed home. Yeah, well. The sentence emptied into a surprise flutter of noise as the two guys, men, barely, and by definition rather than practice, their egos still too molten, came tumbling back from the periphery. Periphery. Philip and Fiaz laughingly mounted on his shoulder. Philip had Fiaz laughingly mounted on his shoulder. A half fireman carry with the latter's elbow stabbed into the divot of Philip's collarbone. Fiaz, he at first looked like he might have been grinning through the debacle but the way his skin pulled upwards from his teeth said different it was a grimace barred teeth restrained by a membrane decorum put my husband down talia fluttered reaching for her groom to be i can handle it they snarly come back without an anchor in fact philip could have kept fias suspended forever but he relented as talia curved a shoulder against him arms raised like a supplicant he set Fiaz down and took the languid step back, thumbs hooked through his belt buckles, his grin still easy as you please. Jackass, said Fiaz, testing the indignity from himself. So tell me about this place, Philip, said Talia, voice billowing in volume, filling the room, the house, and it's dark. Tell me this isn't secretly at Mastoon Castle, because I'll kill myself if it is. I heard they buried a dancing girl on the walls and the castle shakes if anyone ever thinks about dancing near it. And the manor seemed to breathe in, drinking her promise. I could tell we all noticed it all at once, but instead of hightailing high it, we bent our heads like this was a baptism. The house might hold you to that, I blurted before I could stop myself, and sheer wrongness of the statement, the weird puppyish eagerness in its jump from my throat made me cringe. A year spent making acquaintances with the demon inside you. Each new day of fresh covenant, it does things to you. More specifically, it does things inside you. To have to barter for the bravery to go outside, pick up the phones, and 10 minutes assured to the upward trajectory of your recovery, that the appointments are enough, that you can be enough, that one day this will be enough for you to make things okay. All those things change you. Still, no one loved Askins. If anything, the words let something in their expressions. The last light of the day etching their faces in rough shadows. Talia held my gaze, her eyes cold black water. Luckily, Philip said, Philip and stretched like a dog, long and lazy, completely unself conscious. Scratched behind his ear, a smile crooked in his lips. This isn't Matsu Castle. Fiaz patted Talia's arm. Nah, not even Philip could run out of a place like that. Philip tried on abashment, complete with honest to God, all shucks, toe scuffing. It didn't work. At this point, he'd been homecoming king, class father Victorian, debate captain, chess wonderkind, every type of impress impressive a boy could hope to be, king of kings in a place of princes. Even when they try, guys like him don't do self effacing they could be good sports. So I think that's going to be all the time I have because I ranted too much at the beginning of this. So that is first chapter Friday. We're leaving off on page 20. So there's about 10 more chapters left in page 20 or chapter one, 10 more pages left in chapter one. This book is super cool. I'm really looking forward to finishing it. And I'm confident that in the drive uh, to go visit my family for the holidays that I will be able to finish this. And I look forward to coming back and giving you a full review. So if you have anything else that you're interested in, please let me know. And I hope you guys just have the most magical holiday season if you have not already celebrated yours. So have a super day.